So, I asked you if you were comfortable um, to respond to the little email that I sent out. If anyone that, that has some years under the belt, they wanted to show some of the, uh, share some of their wisdom. And you did, and I really appreciate that. Here's a little challenge. I'm going to read some of these to you. My dad calls, he would have called these golden nuggets. These are golden nuggets. And, and maybe just a fun challenge. See if you can think about a biblical principle. I have found that what I heard from you is biblically true, first and foremost. And this is the nuance behind some of these principles. Here's one. One brother said, I found my marriage grows stronger when I am applying basic Christian principles like faith, trust, mercy, and love towards my wife. And it weakens when I fail to show these things. Same effect when I participate with her in activities like study and prayer. Also, I know spouses are given certain rights that the other is to fulfill, but I personally found that focusing on my rights as a spouse, i.e. what she owes me, it's not really fulfilling. Made me think about Philippians chapter 2. Have this mindset about you, which was yours in Christ. This counting others more significant than yourself. Imagine that. Counting others more significant than yourself. Brother says, you know, I've not really found it to be fruitful to sit around and wait to see what she does for me. But I'll take the initiative and I'll love her. We love God because he, John said, he first loved us. One brother who's had a lot of experience says something practical. First of all, a lack of intimacy is a good indicator of how the marriage is doing. Maybe something we need to ask ourselves this morning. It's good to compliment each other going out of your way to remind each other the good that you see in one another, the love that you have for one another. Remember, especially for those who may have children, that one day those children are going to be gone, but that spouse remains. They're the one that you're in a covenant relationship with. One sister had a few points. She's a woman after my own heart because she's three points. And everything she says, by the way, and her husband did too. Her husband was three points. He responded. Both of them responded three points. They are officially my favorite ones for this week. Sorry, you all lose. Um, no, but, but and now what I love about this is she's saying she, she prays through all of these things as well. Number one, choosing to see the best. Um, I've got sometimes a little bit of my paraphrasing, and then I'll, and then I'll quote here. Uh, sometimes our thoughts are not checked, and they lead us too far away, so they need to be with purpose and controlled. If not, bad situations or thoughts can lead to frustration and a feeling of division. Quote, we have the ability to allow our thoughts to drive compassion or resentment, love or anger, self-seeking. In my mind, we... We work daily to prove our thought. So make sure you are the thinker and the thought is purposeful and driven from truth. Uh, I, I, I think a lot of Philippians chapter 4 on this one. What we are to think on. What we are to think about. We have to, we have to be purposeful. And just, just like was said, if not... These things get away from us, and they don't just stay in here. They make it to here, and they come out. And so we need to be prayerful about that. Are we going to build up? Or are we going to break down? By the way, let me go ahead and insert one of her husband's feedback was knowing and appreciating who you're going to marry. Because we all have things that we need to work on, but some persons, in order to build you up, criticize you. What an awkward way to do that. While others encourage you. 
to be built up. That's what a marriage does. It's like love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It rejoices what? Man, it's rejoicing whenever things are going right and wrong. It doesn't rejoice. It doesn't kick you down whenever you've gone wrong. It's like someone's been in their Bible. She went on, she said, a moment doesn't define the marriage. Quote, one struggle may turn into, it's all bad, you always, you never, etc. So we made the choice to allow freedom for moments of struggle and remove terms of absolute such as never and always. One moment in time is exactly what it is. It's just one moment. And we decide to make the conscious choice to allow it And move forward without allowing it more control. We should pray for patience during growth, both parties. Love covers a multitude of sins. Don't you know that? And and we make a character out of each other. Or maybe I should say a caricature out of each other. This is who that person is for a fact. You know, we're passionate and we can get through an argument that happens time and again and maybe... A t- something slips like that. You know, you always say that to me. But the reality is, you let that thing go on, and these arguments are happening all the time, and it's always, <laughs> you always, you never. And that is the picture that you've painted for that person, and you're making it as if for a fact that's who they are, and the other person is on the receiving end, and they always have to hear that. And so that's not wise communication. And it stays with people, and it can become a reality. That must be who they think I am, and that's who they are. And so praying that we have grace with each other and allow each other to grow. Checking a feeling before you act. Appreciated this one. The feeling can be acknowledged, but we need patience and prayer before we act. We may find that while we feel a certain way, it doesn't mean it's necessarily true. This calls for love and maturity. Wanting the best for one another. Quote, the emotion of the feeling can potentially drive negative behavior, attitude, or outcome. Often I can remember getting wrapped up in a feeling or thought and wasting so much energy only to recognize I can really leave this with the Lord. Pray about it and allow Him to show me the way while I use this time to shine His light in another way. Sometimes you circle back and see how God has worked the details out. It's all right in a marriage to feel a certain way. But we got to be careful before we are so sure that that is correct and we make knee-jerk actions, decisions, and comments. Brethren, obviously in life, sometimes we have to make a decision, we have to make it now. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about whenever the emotion takes over, it cripples us, And we make knee-jerk reactions or thoughts. And we need to pray through that as well. Her husband, if I can say, uh, two other points that he made. The first one I already brought up. But the second one was the beauty of reminding yourself that you're married to your best friend. You want to talk about practicality? You need to be spending time hanging out with your friends. You need to make time with your spouse. Don't turn into that couple. Well, after the kids were out, we had to learn who we were. Does it have to be that way? I, I personally appreciated this. He goes, I didn't ever understand the guys that were always golfing every weekend or with their buddies every weekend. Because God forbid, you know, he wanted to be with, I don't know, his wife. (laughs) It's okay to have hobbies, he says, but, you know. He also went on to say that your wife needs to be encouraged. Given, again, this role that she's in, the following that she has to do, the same concept, build her up. And he reminds us that in a marriage, we need respect. 
It's not because men don't want love. They need love. And a woman is to love her husband. But because of the role that is given him, sisters, we covet. And what we're just saying, we, we, we want you to want to respect us. I find it interesting in Ephesians chapter 5 that God doesn't say, wife, make sure the husband loves you. He says, husbands, love your wife. And he doesn't say, husbands, make sure that your wife respects you. He says, likewise, wives, respect your husbands. One sister said, don't blow things out of proportion. Every marriage has rough moments, but not every marriage is rough. And she also found that Maybe she or we, we all need to do better on articulating this to one another so that that way others don't have a misrepresentation of what marriage is. I'm the only one that has an argument. I'm the only one that had a rough patch. Listen, there's a time, right? I remember when I was a kid, something will happen, and I'd be the first one out of us three boys to share the news to everyone and their dog. And my dad would say, Sean, be quiet. There's a time, obviously, where we need to be quiet, use some discretion. But brethren, you know what? Transparency is not a bad thing. We need to be transparent in our marriages, and we need to be transparent to one another. I put in the newsletter, I asked those who are older who have been married longer, do you feel comfortable sharing your wisdom and your instruction to us younger people? Because you should feel comfortable doing that. So for those of us who are younger, not only do we need to have that spirit that invites that counsel, but we also need to go to them and make sure that they know your voice is welcomed in our home. Amen? We're all in this together. But can I say something? Even if your marriage is right now rough, just rough, God can turn that around. I've got one more for you, and then I'm going to go in, and, and it's going to be my, my, my portion of this, something that I wanted to share with you. One brother says, feelings change, and so, do, uh, so does our perspective. What you believe your situation to be changes actually every week and month. It's always moving. But some believe that this fixed position lasts forever. And so, therefore, they need to do something now. And this, again, leads to knee-jerk reactions. The reality is, is that either by situation or time, many times it'll change or work out. Don't judge it by what you feel or think today. Look at the long term and be prayerful. If you do this, and if you're more gentle about it, more than likely you're going to succeed. So, you see some common denominators between this, and some of it's nuance, and they all kind of fit together. So think about the best about a person. Don't let them, that one moment, define the whole thing. Check your thoughts where they go, and also remember this. If you don't do that, that means that you will behave in that reality, but it's not a reality that you've created. I don't know. He doesn't talk to me. He never talks to me. This is how it is. That's the way it's always going to be. Therefore, he's never going to talk to me. Therefore, I'm not going to talk to him. You see how that works? So I'm not going to talk to him. And then maybe over time, some things build up and wrong decisions are being made. And now there's some things maybe she wants to talk to but about. But now she, she doesn't want to talk about it because now you're going to find out. <laughs> All sorts of fun stuff that can be going on here. He says we need to remind ourselves, ask ourselves, what is the value of your relationship? He was reminded there's, this, there's these two girls, there's, they share one body. I don't know if you've, you've ever seen this. It's, it's, it is. Two girls, they, they share one body, two heads. And he says, this is marriage. He said, this is marriage. This is marriage. You want to do good to the other person, do you not? It wouldn't make sense to hurt yourself. There's a passage about that, Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul tells men, how you treat your wife, treat them like yourself. Because no one hates himself. 
But on the flip side of that, the reality is you cannot do your own thing and act like it won't affect that other member of that marriage. It just doesn't happen. You're strong, you bring strength. You're weak, you bring weakness. Brethren, I really appreciate your thoughts. And it was encouraging to me. I've got just about four passages I, I'm going to bring up and then, and then I'm done for this morning. It could be, though, that someone here, and just unbeknownst is, to us, is in a not good place. And if you're not, that's okay, but here's something to chew on that you can counsel other brethren with if you come across this. It's good to be mindful of passages like 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'd like to begin reading in verse 18. And in the context, Peter is reminding the brethren of their responsibilities in many different areas of life. He started with the governing authorities, he's going to talk about slave master, and he's going to then transition into marriage. Verse 18, servants be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, uh, excuse me, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his, sin, in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respect and pure conduct." Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of the gold and jewelry, or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight, uh, he says, is very precious. Very precious. Brethren, my hope for you is that this is not your marriage, but I want a word of encouragement. I'm not forgetting you, I'm thinking about you. When you find yourself in this unfortunate situation, no matter how you got there, don't, don't fret about that right now. You're there. And you're wanting to do right and good. You look to Jesus. And please don't let that sound cliche in your mind and your heart. That's what Peter did. Listen. Listen. Governing authorities, honor them. Masters, rough, obey them. Sincerely obey them. Paul will write that to Titus. So sincerely, I'll add that word. That comes from Titus chapter 2. Sincerely do it. But how? You look to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was reviled. He didn't talk back. Look at the way he was treated. He didn't threaten. He left it to God. This is a situation that no one wants their son and daughter in, but here you are. You be the shining light. When words don't matter anymore, you serve that spouse like you're serving your Lord. And when you commit to that, and when you believe in that, and when you draw closer to Him, I'm going to tell you something that the world won't agree with, but I believe it. You can even in that scenario find joy and peace and love. And you can have a life even in that reality. You know, Jeremiah, I want you to think about this. Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah is going to speak on behalf of God to a people who are in captivity. They're not home. 
They're not where they should be. They're not where God wanted to be. This is not, by any means, the ideal atmosphere. And you come to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Do you see that? He says, in this unfortunate set of, of circumstances, but here we are, get on with it. Marry, have kids, build homes, plant vineyards, enjoy the produce. And this city, this dreaded city that you don't want to be in, pray for it. Brethren, pray for that spouse. Sometimes, oh, mm, you hate this. Sometimes your spouse becomes your enemy in a sense. And what did Jesus say to do? Hate them. No, he says love on them and pray for them. And he says you pray for the city and for its welfare and you will experience that. But how did Jesus do that? This is my question. Okay, so we suffer through it, so we get through it. So how did he do that? I don't know. How did he do that? Love? Brethren, this is, this is my part two. I've got my three points this morning. This is my part two. I believe that love is the answer to successful marriages. And I believe that love fundamentally is the problem whenever marriages are not making it out of rough spots. We all have rough spots. But some don't get out of rough spots. And I believe love is the issue. Okay, now I'm going to read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And you turn over there, 1 Corinthians cha chapter 13. I'm going to read verses 4 through 7. But as you're turning over there, let me just remind you of the context. These people did not have love. And because they were lacking in love, it resulted... That there was a problem. You know, for example, whenever you're not seeing intimacy in the marriage, the, the answer is not to, well, let's just get back into the bedroom and that'll make everything better. That's a, re, that, that's a symptom of something lacking. And these guys were lacking love and now you see symptoms of it. Well, I follow Apollo, so I follow Cephas. Oh, where, where's the love in that? Who are you falling in love with? What's this division about? I have my father's wife. Where's the love for your father? I've taken this brother to court. Where's the love for your, for your brother? Suffer the wrong? Well, I know he doesn't want to eat meat, but he's going to eat meat if he's around me. Where's your consideration of his conscience? I'm going to take off this veil. I will be heard. Where's your love for the Lord and his order of things? This will be my will, my, my meal. I'll eat on my own. Where was your love in, the, in, the, in the, the, the fellowship mill? And then you come to, then you come to this worship. Here's this worship. It's so divisive. I've got, I've got this, this ability. Look at this ability that I have. Oh, you speak in tongues, but, but I, I have the gift of prophecy. And then he'll, he'll put it all into order in chapter 14. But sandwiched between these issues, chapter 13, 12, 13, and 14, is what Paul does. He goes, you, you, know what you're, you know what you're missing is love. And you can have all these things, all these abilities, tongues of angels and men, all these things, but if you don't have lo uh, love, you're nothing. And so he says, verse 4, he says, this is the fix before I go on. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. 
It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. It doesn't, it doesn't tally up all the wrongdoings. But rejoices with the truth. Mm, it believes all things. It believes all things. It bears all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. My dad used to say, yeah, 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 love, it's what love is. But here, it's what love does. This is what love does. It's not just a thought. That's an action. Brethren, I'm going to tell you something. All those golden nuggets that I shared it with you at the beginning mean nothing if you do not have love. It is like a guy who smokes two packs a day and you give him all the tools and the nuances in the world, but he doesn't want to stop smoking. It doesn't help him. I appreciate and I love the marriage books. But I got to say something. All these marriage books that you read aren't as powerful as the Word of God, and they don't mean anything if you don't have love. Sorry. And now I'm going to go a step further. If you loved, you would do those things in those secu that secular material anyways. News. Shocker. So, Billy and Katie are younger. They're in their 20s, and they get into a new house. I think I shared this with you, but too bad. I'm going to share it with you again. And my dad's got this, this junker car. Everyone that knows dad knows it's a junker car. He's got to put new oil in it every other day because it leaks oil everywhere. Dad pulls up to their new house right into their beautiful driveway and leaks oil everywhere. Billy's it's not the first time stuff like, something like this has happened. Dad, Dad, ugh, why don't you park out in the street? Let your oil drip in the street. This is, you know, I'm not verbatim, but basically, you know, well, you, you let me know all the things, you know, let me know all the things that you don't like and I'll do it. Some woman in here is going, oh, I know that feeling. No, but here it is. So here's the thing. Even if, even if Billy could make this perfect list, and he wouldn't be able to, right? And also because it would, it, new things would pop out. Because if he's not considerate, there's going to be something he didn't even think of, and he'd have to add something on the list. By the way, God does that in his word. He's actually said, you've done something I didn't even come to mind. And in Romans chapter 1 says that we create evil. The, the thing is, <laughs> is that God expects us to learn principles. Okay, but even if Billy gave him a perfect list, list and dad just aced it which you know he's not going to don't you you know he's not going to ace that list do you think that that relationship would be right i picture dad driving up the next saturday as billy's standing out front and he almost goes in the driveway and then goes back and then parks and goes mm. because <laughs> Billy would realize, you don't want to do it, do you? But the reality is, whenever the desire's not there, you're going to be messing up that list the whole time. Brethren, i got to tell you, I've spent so much time, and I mean this sincerely, chewing on how I wanted to deliver this, this lesson. And I started thinking, okay, let's go to uh, Boaz and Ruth, and let's look at, oh, here's an interesting one, 1 Samuel 25, with Abigail and Nabal and David and this, this odd predicament that, that she was put in and all this kind of stuff. And I'm going to be honest with you, I just, I just had an epiphany. I'm like, they already know this. They already know this. Many times when we're in this position, knowledge is not our problem. I'm going to prove it to you. And I'm going to pick on him a little bit, but I asked him beforehand. I asked him if I could embarrass him. We, Jordan and I have had the privilege of sitting down with, with uh, Kelton and Hannah and just enjoying time and talking. And we'll talk about marriage, just all this, this good stuff. And, and, and it's been really cool 
listening to them. And I'll pick on Kelton for a moment. It's been very humbling and very encouraging listening to Kelton. The way he, he loves his wife. Uh, acknowledging uh, frustration here, but no, you're right. That's not, no, that needs to change. That's not correct. And, and his love, and just, and just, you know, he'll, he'll just turn to Hannah and say, you know, I love you, right? I'll do anything for you. <laughs> and, uh, and I mean, why should we stop doing that? Now, brother, and I, I've got a question, and this is why I asked him, because I, this isn't meant to embarrass him, but, but d- for the men here, majority of you, brother, how long have you, have you been in the Lord now? Two years. And how long have y'all been married now? One year. Okay. Do you think he acts that way towards his wife because he has more biblical knowledge than you? More Bible knowledge than you? No. No. Do you think he acts that way because he has more experience in marriage than you do? No. Okay, so then why is it that he's getting it and I've sat down with men that have been married for decades and have never acted that way? Well, they didn't know Ephesians 5. Don't give me that. They knew Ephesians 5 and they knew 1 Peter 3. They knew Colossians parallel passage. Don't give me that. Let's move on now. They knew that. Matter of fact, I've had couples tell me, listen, going back to those passages is not helping me right now. The problem is we're not loving. Have you ever thought for a moment why God created you? That's a beautiful thought. I don't know, he just got bored? Really? Is that what you think? He just got bored. I'm going to go out on a limb and say one of the perfect examples that we have is a man and woman that come together and most men and women decide they want what? And why do they want those little babies? They got all this love between them. And they want to share this love. And here God is in his eternity, whatever that, all that means. And it says, I'm going to create a heavenly host. And I'm going to create these beings. Oh, there's a problem. Well, I'm going to redeem them. Because see, there's this problem and it's not okay that there's a problem with them. So I'm going to send my son into the world is what we're going to do. And we're going to redeem them. That's what love is, brethren. If you've learned Christ, then you've learned that. But someone says, all right, but I'm just going to be honest with you. I agree with you intellectually, but I just don't feel the love. There it is. I don't feel it. And this is my last point, and then the sermon is yours. Um, Jeremiah chapter 2. So let's go back to this, this people that would go into Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah chapter 2. And, and I think that generally speaking, principally, this tells us where our problem is. And it will give us some guidance about what we need to be doing. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1. The, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. And all who ate of it incurred guilt. Disaster came upon them, declares the Lord. Oh, God, he, 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 takes, it, he takes a trip down memory lane. He goes, oh, I'm thinking about you. Mm. I can see you there in your youth. I can see your love. I can see your devotion. I can see your trust in me. I can see how you followed me. You are mine. You are my first fruits. Oh, and anyone who tried to take you from me, mm-mm. Those were the days, in a sense. I remember that. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the clans of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, what wrong did your fathers find in me? That they went far from me. 
What did I do? Where did I go wrong? Tell me. And went after worthlessness and became worthless. They didn't say, where's the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness in a land of deserts and pits and a land of drought and deep darkness in a land that none passes through where no man dwells. And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things. But when you went, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where's the Lord? Those who handled the law didn't. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after the things that do not profit. I'm thinking about us and I remember how we were and I remember how it was and I remember the love between us. And I'm asking you, what did I do wrong? And when you needed me, I don't remember anyone asking for me. And my own priests didn't ask for me because they didn't even know me. Where are you? There's an illustration about a man and a woman first married and in love. And they, they'd always drive in his pickup truck. And she'd sit arm to arm, shoulder to shoulder with him. Smiles in both of their faces. He put his arm around her. And they did this for the longest time. And then one day the wife looks up. And she realizes her husband's not there. He's all the way on the other side. And she loses it. And she tells him with broken heart, she's like, what is happening to us? How have we come to this place? I remember when I used to sit by you, shoulder to shoulder, and you put your arm around me. And here we are, and I feel nothing. And he, brokenhearted, tenderly with compassion, looked at her and said, My love, I never moved. I never moved. Brethren, God does not move from us. Whenever we are lacking that love, it's not that something happened with him. We moved. And i got to be straight with you. We just need to be humbled. We need to be humbled. We came into Israel, if you will, and have enjoyed all these things, and our heart grows fat, and it becomes numb, and we can't feel as if these things were due us. They weren't due us, but they were given us out of love. And Jesus Christ came down and he served us. How far down did he come? He came, John chapter 13, to our feet and he washed them. So if your marriage is struggling, you need to marry Christ and remember that marriage that you had with him. You cannot grow stronger to him, stronger with him. You cannot sit shoulder to shoulder with the Lord and then look at that spouse and go, I don't know how to love them. That's not how we learned Christ. Amen?